Turn, if you would, to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John. I'm going to have you stand, if you would take out your Bibles, because this is, I think, it rates right up there with Genesis 1-1. Because here's the issue. You either believe God's word or you don't. And when he makes plain statements, you either believe them or you don't. And in this case, God tells us very specifically how the universe got here. And you either believe that or you don't. So you either believe in a creator whose name we will see here is the word, or you believe that billions of years plus chance plus maybe some chemicals that we don't know where they came from, somehow exploded about 13.7 billion years ago and turned from goo to you. (laughs) Or we believe what God's word says, that we are absolutely created by him. Let's read it together. Verse 1, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you for that truth, and pray now that as we study these few verses, that by your Spirit you would speak to your church We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Would you take your seats? You see, we have a choice to make in our world. We can either believe God's word or we can not believe God's word. We can believe what it plainly says or we can come up with some other way that every single thing that exists in the known universe came about. Your Bible clearly says, speaking of Jesus who is the Christ, because we're going to be told who the Word is in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I want you to also notice that three times the Word is equated to God. The Word was that's in this Greek, in the original text, means to meet face to face. It means to stand face to face and stare. So there's two people here. God the Father, God the Son, they're looking at one another, they're staring face to face. It declares very plainly that God is, that he is the uncreated one, and by him and through him were all things that were created, created, and nothing in the universe exists except that he made it. That's a plain statement. This is not open to interpretation, and here's why this is important to you as a Christian. Because every last one of you in here who has believed on the only begotten Son of God has done so primarily because of the truth found in God's Word. Amen? John 3.16 is known to probably every last one of you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why should you believe John 3.16 if you don't believe John 1.1 through 3? Why should you believe John 1, 1 through 3 if you don't believe Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Do you see the conundrum that you get into when you start discerning which part of the Bible you're going to believe and which you're going to throw out? Because you think that science has somehow come up with an answer for how we got here that eliminates the need for a creator God. And I hope to speak into your life this morning a little bit of a plug for our Sunday night series, to be sure, because we are in Genesis right now in chapter one. I wanna encourage you to be there for it, or at least watch online. But your Bible plainly declares that in the beginning was the Word. And in this background, though you can't see it, and by the way, one of the next things we're going to do is change all of this video projection to very high definition screens to where you'll be able to see these things. But if you look very closely at the center screen, squint if you must, 
what you can't actually see really clearly, but especially if you look down here in the margins and in the corners, you're gonna see that most of what is in that photo taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, the Deep Field Space Telescope, there's almost 10,000 galaxies in that photo. Those 10,000 galaxies, every last one of them consists of around 100 billion stars. David himself, when he looked up at the night sky, said this in Psalm 8, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you have ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man? Now remember, David wrote 1,000 years before Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. What does it say? And the Son of Man, verse four, Psalm eight, and the Son of Man, that you visit him. You see, that photo should make you ask some serious questions about how you got here. Are you the random chance processes of vast amounts of time with an unknown source of all kinds of chemicals, we would call it matter, atomic structure, which we don't know how that got here, or are you actually the assemblage of some very finely tuned parts along with extremely precise information? Are you goo to you, or are you the hands of God? Your Bible says there's nothing in the universe that wasn't created without the word creating it spoken into existence exactly what Genesis 1 tells us. That God, in fact, spoke into existence from nothing. In Latin, ex nihilo, from nothing came everything that is. And strangely enough, astrophysicists and those in higher levels of science are still trying to figure out where this universe came from. The current state of that study, known as cosmology, very specifically origins, cosmogony, if you look at it now, most everyone will say, well, we got here by the Big Bang. I happen to actually agree with them. God said bang, and there the universe was. <laughs> but the, the, the bottom line is, is you have to believe we got here some way. John 1 tells us exactly what happens, and we got this from God himself. It's not guesswork. You see, as wonderful as science is, and by the way, I believe wholeheartedly in the study of all of the sciences. I am absolutely for using your mind and stretching it as far as it can go. But the, amen? It, it, the problem is if you stretch it too far, you do exactly what Romans 1 will say to us this morning. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You take it so far that there must be a naturalistic understanding of everything, even when the evidence does not come to the conclusion that you think it should. And so where we are today is this. And again, I beg your pardon for the resolution we have here, but this is actually a cosmological model of the Big Bang. If you talk to an astrophysicist today, chances are they believe this is what happens. Now let me explain this to you in layman's terms. It means something extremely small containing the entire universe, so small by the way as to believe to have been invisible, some 13.7 billion years ago was coalesced into what was called the singularity. That singularity began to have quantum fluctuations, which means it began to wiggle. It then exploded and produced the entire universe as we know it, expanding ever outward to the point that we are in our universe today. Now to me, that's kind of hard to figure out because I wasn't around 13.7 billion years ago and I have a tough time finding a, a way to display to explain the order that is in the entire universe, especially the more fine points of that order, which would be you and me, after a massive explosion of nothing but matter. Because in our universe today, 
we find no evidence of anything becoming more organized when it explodes. Nothing. Give a young man a soda can, a few bugs, and a firecracker. Do the experiment yourself. <laughs> no matter how many times you blow it up, and by the way, inside of that soda can will be all of the necessary components of life. And if it explodes, all we can expect is extra chaos. And yet somehow we progress from absolute utter chaos to the finely tuned universe and that's the explanation for how we got here. To me, that seems a little far-fetched. And I realize that I am not mocking science. I'm simply saying that if you do not believe John 1, 1 through 3, and you do not believe Genesis chapter 1, then you have to come up with some other alternate view. And when you look at the universe, that's the best explanation that we have. Let's look at that a little bit today and see whether that's even reasonable. To do so, we turn our attention to the fourth gospel. John's gospel gives the, the mystery of the identity of Christ. Now notice what it says, in the beginning was the word, the term logos. And it doesn't just mean word like we think, well that word means. It means the sum and the total of absolutely anything and everything that could be known or will ever be known in other words, it is all knowledge forever. In the beginning was the word. In other words, in the beginning was there was an absolutely marvelous design team. That design team consisted of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And everything that could be known was confined in one of them known as the word. God the Father existing in three God existing in three component parts, each of them a whole. Hard for us to wrap our head around, but your Bible says that God exists in three persons, amen? Here we have two of them face to face. And the word was, notice it, with God. You see, all of that information, all of that structure had to come from someplace. There's actually a theory that's being floated even today, it's called transpermia. What that simply means is now, because no one can explain exactly how all of this got here, one of the great explanations is E.T. phoned home and brought it here. And again, I'm not actually mocking, I'm saying this is legitimately the way the universe is being looked at. Because the universe is so immensely complex, and very specifically, the biologic life on this planet is so complex that the information itself had to come from somewhere. And so the aliens, traveling from some distant galaxy, brought that information here and literally planted a seed of the information here on Earth. Look it up. Google it. Here's the problem. Who made the aliens? <laughs> Where did the aliens get the information? Where did the aliens get the matter? When did the aliens start to allow things like chemicals to possess information, store the information, and then self-diagnose and self-replicate that information so that whatever they produced began to reproduce itself without anyone thinking or adding more information or energy to it? It is a mind-bogglingly complex piece of work of thinking. God helps us out. In the beginning was the Word. Everything that needs to be known and will ever be known contained in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, imparted to the universe all that it needs. You see, you have a choice. There's either a creator or there's not. One, naturalism, the other, creationism. The fourth gospel defines for us who that creator is, his name is Jesus. We'll see him come into flesh in verse 14. He's described here as, as the word or logos. Let me ask you a question. Was God a liar? 
We ask you a question again, is God a liar? Okay, if God's not a liar and he says he created everything, did he create everything? And yet so many people don't believe Genesis 1 and don't believe John 1 that in the beginning there was a God before everything else was, he was there first. They try and explain the universe and everything in it by naturalistic means and then say, well, God kind of guided it. Family, then God lied to you. He did not lie to you. He has not told you everything about what he did, but he's told you enough that when you look up at the stars, you're supposed to go, hmm, can't explain that. When you look at the unbelievable structure within your own human body, you're, su you're supposed to think, wow, how'd that get there? What came first, the blood vessel or the blood? What came first, the heart or the arteries that feed it? What came first, the clotting properties of that blood or the blood cell, the soma itself? You're supposed to think of those things because here's what happens. You realize there's so much stored information in you, you know it, it's called DNA. That God so uniquely designed every last human being that you can all be identified by the information it is specifically you. You see, you're supposed to look at the creation and see the creator. But if you don't like that postulation, if you don't like the hypotheses that flows from that, the only other option is it made itself. It came about by random chance processes and billions of years. That is the only other explanation that makes a modicum of sense. And so people have been on two tracks, and up until about 150 years ago, maybe 200 at the very most, people universally believed that there was a creator God who dwelt in the heavens, who made everything that we see. But then we did exactly what Romans 1 says. We began to worship the creation, and we professed all of that intelligence that we have so strongly that we began to believe our own story and then became fools ourselves. We missed God by thinking we figured him out of the equation. You see, what I see is that design absolutely implies that there must be a designer. There's not one person sitting in this room right now as absolutely minuscule as the structural design characteristics are of this building that thinks that this building, if we gave a few billion years and a whole bunch of the basic elements of concrete, steel, wood, uh, all of those you know, already refined things that we would say are copper and wiring and those types of things, none of you, is there anyone in here that believes that this building that could produce itself if we just gave it enough time and some dirt? This building is so ridiculously simple compared to a single protein that it, we can't even talk about it in the same breath. And yet people believe that somehow goo became you. You don't believe that airplanes just suddenly mysteriously appeared in the desert and someone collected them. No, there was a design team that created all of the avionics and everything that helps them stay in the air. What we see in our world is design. You see, what we see is the hand of logos. Something plus knowledge plus energy. In other words, you have to have something, impart knowledge into it, and then place energy in its location so that that can become whatever it is that you've designed it to be. You don't believe that this carpet is going to become another person. And yet, contained within this carpet are the basic building blocks of life. All you need is a little bit of carbon, some hydrogen, some oxygen. What do we see? We see the hand of Logos, we see the hand of God. And the reason that you don't see an argument being made here is because the creation is so specific, you should be able to look at it and go, well, that didn't make itself. 
But if you don't like that conclusion, then you start looking elsewhere. Instead of worshiping the creator, who is blessed forevermore, exactly what Paul wrote in Romans 1, you begin to worship the ground, you begin to worship the trees, you begin to worship the dirt, you begin to worship the atmosphere, you begin to worship water, you begin to worship everything except God. And that is exactly what we see in our world today. Now, does that mean we shouldn't take care of our creation? Absolutely not. We've been made stewards of it, and we've done a lousy job of that. But we don't worship the creation. We worship the creator. You see, part of the problem with this passage is that for many people, uh, they don't get the Greek here. (laughs) And quite frankly, it's all Greek to me. An accurate translation of this passage is essential for your understanding. What it says is eon pros teon. In other words, there was all knowledge, absolutely everything confined in God the Son and God himself existent before everything that you see ever was. It does not say that the word became a God. It says the word was God. It doesn't say that that's a little g. It says it's a big g. This is teos. We're talking about word is teos. In other words, whoever the word is, which we find out who it is in a little bit, whoever that person, because it's a him, amen, whoever that person is, is God. So the next, amen, the next time a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door and says, I got a flyer for you, do one of two things. Either say, thank you, I need more fire starter, (laughs) or say, no, thank you, I don't want any lies in my house for my kids to, to read. Because they're the only ones who have a translation called the New World that says Jesus was a God. It does not say that. It says Jesus, the Word, is God, period. He is ho deon eo logos. It's very clear in the original language. And every single manuscript, ancient manuscript that we have, says exactly the same thing. So it's extremely important that at the beginning of John's gospel, we realize the one who is the word is God. And the one who is the word created the entire universe, everything in it. It goes on to say, kai, teos, eon, hologos. It literally is rendered in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, and you could actually say, God, yes, God was and is the word. Jesus did this. When you look at the stars, you can thank the Lord Jesus when you look at the complexity of your own human eye, which by the way has a reversed image on the back of your retina, so all kinds of little rods and cones back there that perceive light, varying wavelengths, you can thank God, because I'm pretty sure the parts of your eye didn't float around someplace waiting to become an eyeball. (laughs) You see, you have to ask the right questions. People don't ask the right questions. They just go, well, you know, my professor said, Where did your professor get the original matter? Where did the professor get the singularity? Where did that ball that was the singularity come from? Who put it there? Because I think most of you realize that nothing can't become something unless there's something greater than the thing that has been created. That's a function of Newtonian physics. The thing made must always have a cause greater than itself. God says, I'm the thing that caused everything else to exist. I made it. Amen. (laughs) Notice what he says. Verse 3. How many things are all things? Doesn't it say in verse 3, all things? You know why it says that? In the Greek language, it is a definite article. It means absolutely everything that is, he made. It doesn't say, well, he made a few things here on earth. It doesn't say he kind of reorganized matter to make a planet habitable for people. It says anything that is, in other words, all that is in existence, all things, 
were made through him. In other words, every last thing in the universe was created by God. And his name is the Word. And notice, just in case you missed the first part of it, he clears it up with the second half of the sentence. And without him was nothing made that was made. Whenever God repeats something, he's trying to get our attention. Amen? So what he's saying is, look, I did this. What do we see? Do we see the hand of the creator? Do we see the word? Do we see hologos? Do we see natural selection in a whole lot of time? Do we see random chemicals floating around in space or do we see a very organized creation? So, so what does the evidence that we see show? I wanna give you a couple things just to think on a little bit. Most of you, if you've had any type of study of biology, especially if you've gone to college and you've studied physiology, you've studied anatomy, you've studied any of the medical sciences, you have been told that in essence, chemicals can organize themselves, chemicals can store information, and chemicals can, without any outside input and guidance, not only store that information, but actually make up information so that that thing that is being stored upon becomes actually more complex. Now let's ignore the fact that the second law of thermodynamics clearly states that everything in the universe tends towards decay or disorder. In other words, it's known as the law of entropy. Uh, you're a case for entropy. Look at your body, uh, is it getting better? It's not, because every system in the known universe tends towards decay. It begins to lose function, begins to lose energy, it begins to get less than what it currently is. That's also a function of physics. But let's say you can reverse that. We're just gonna give that to them. There was an experiment that was done in 1953 for the first time by a, a science team, Miller and Uray. It's still in textbooks to this day. And it's the old lightning struck a pond somewhere in the primordial universe and it produced chemicals. Those chemicals stuck around for billions of years in suspension in that primordial pond. Um, they got very friendly with each other they created baby chemical compounds. Those baby chemical compounds then hung around. They got friends with other chemical compounds. And eventually they stored up enough of these repeated modifications to chemicals that they eventually became the building blocks of life. And here's how that looks chemically. You have raw chemicals. Those raw chemicals turn into amino acids. Amino acids become proteins. Proteins become enzymes. Those enzymes then become single-celled organisms. That is the path of life as it were medically. Now I want to talk about that for a second because here's what happened with that experiment. They assumed that they knew what existed about five billion years ago in this primordial soup that existed here on the earth. So let's again give them their assumption. Their assumption was that it was ammonia, methane, water vapor, and hydrogen. Now how they got that, they dialed somebody up that was around five million years ago and asked them, I don't know, but somehow those chemicals got here, those chemicals floated around this sphere that is our Earth, and then somehow an energy source from outer space began to strike the surface of the Earth. So to repeat this, they did this well over 100,000 times. They produced exactly one chemical precursor to exactly one amino acid. They didn't produce a single protein, they didn't produce a single uh, enzyme, and they surely did not produce even a single-celled organism, which is breathtakingly complex, and we'll get to that in a moment. The reason this is important, what they did produce in rerunning that experiment over and over again, which, by the way, was a closed system, not an open system. A closed system means that you control the environment and everything in it. I think our primordial universe, if it was creating itself, was an open system. In other words, anything could happen anywhere at any time. But again, let's give them the experiment. They produce two chemicals. And I think both of them, you're gonna agree, don't do too much for most life on Earth. Produce two chemical compounds, one of them is cyanide. That's not really good for people. The second is formaldehyde. That's really good for people if you want them to last a long time in a jar. It didn't produce amino acids, proteins, or enzymes. 
Let's take it a step further, because here's what has to happen. If we got here by random chance processes over billions of years, then you have to have chemicals staying around together in suspension in some type of a universe. Those chemicals then get to know each other. They then start talking and communicating. They have to have a language system. You know it as your own DNA, which is, by the way, larger than the Library of Congress if you were to write it out. That information has to be somehow stored. Chemicals, by the way, don't do that. They never do, never will, and never have. Well, let's say they did. Let's look at how complex a single cell within you actually is. There's a chemical that's in your body. It's in every living cell that exists everywhere on this planet. It's a chemical, the short acronym for it is ATP. Uh, there was a Nobel, P, Nobel Prize given for the study of that particular chemical compound. Uh, it is a single enzyme. Uh, your, every one of your cell has hundreds of those little miniature motors is what they are and they begin to spin. You might have heard of someone who has a mitochondrial disorder. You have mitochondria inside of every one of your soma, every one of your cells. Those are little motors that actually allow you to take in substances like food, turn them into energy, and then power your body so that you can walk and think and do all those kind of things. And I'm simplifying the science for you just a little bit so you can understand it. But here's what happens. Every one of those little motors spins around about 100 revolutions per second. And each time they spin around, they kick off three electrons. They process your entire body weight in electrons every single day so that you can move and breathe and walk. Now here's the problem with the original experiment. Every last amino acid has a minimum, a minimum, in order to create a protein of about 100,000, you have to have almost 100,000 amino acids of varying degrees to make up the 31 proteins that make up every single cell in your body. They haven't come up with one. Now imagine that every one of those things has to be in exactly the right order for any one of those systems to function. It starts to get a little complex, doesn't it, in its mathematical probability? And yet if you take away any one of those 31 proteins, made up of all of those amino acids, made up of the varying chemical components that made them up, you lose life. There is no life without all 31 of those enzymes arranged in exactly the same protein molecules so that you can create one cell, so that you can make a little tiny motor that spends 100 times a second in every single cell in your body that spits off three electrons so that you can walk around every day. And guess what? You don't have to tell it what to do. It's not like your kids. <laughs> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. You, you see, you can either believe that all of that information came from somewhere, or you can believe somehow that all those chemicals floated around for billions of years and did what they can't do, which is make up information, make up language, make up syntax to that language, and then impart that language to other cells and systems in your body so that they can use it to Self-diagnose, self-replicate. Elvis works at a donut shop in Minnesota. <laughs> or, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and he was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Amen? You want to read more on it? Great book, Dr. Michael Behe, Darwin's Black Box, A Fulfilled Journey by A.E. Wilder Smith, uh, Tremendous Icons of Evolution by Dr. Jonathan Wells, there are brilliant scientists, and by the way, they're not all Christians. There are brilliant scientists all over the world who have come to the conclusion that random chance processes plus billions of years without information equals zip. And so they're, they're trying to figure out, well, you know, aliens did it. 
or they're trying to figure out where all that knowledge and information came from, your Bible tells you it came from the Creator, Jesus. Amen? God bless you. Let's stand and we'll pray together. Join us. We're in Genesis 1 on Sunday nights. We're doing a, a series on creation. Uh, we're covering everything from astronomy to botany. Uh, we're having a blast, so come on out if you're so interested in those types of things. Otherwise, you can watch it online. But I want to encourage you, don't let anybody tell you that believing in God makes you stupid. Because it doesn't. It just makes you ask the right questions. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you that we don't have to put our brains on the shelf. Lord, that we can continue to use these wonderful minds that you created uh, to think rightly, to look up at the heavens and ask ourselves the right questions about who is this God that imparted all of this order, this amazing irreducible complexity to our universe. Father, we thank you for those truths which cause us to see you. Lord, we look and we come to a dead end and we realize that there must be a God in heaven who loves us. And in fact, you did come down, Jesus, and you met us here on this earth. You paid the price for our sins that we might be reconciled to God the Father, that that wrath would be put away and we could know you personally. How great is our God indeed. And we bless your name, Lord. We thank you for this morning. And God's people all said, amen. amen.